This is the last uh, lecture, and we have uh, Vicky who's going to tell us about film music. Thank um, you. Yeah, thanks, Giuseppe, for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about using focused iron being milling um, to um, thin specimens for cryotomography. <laughs> Um, so just here's a very um, br um, brief outline of my talk. So some introductory material about why we use FIB and a little bit of history, then going on to some th the instrumentation, how we nail the lamellae, and then some experimental workflows for sort of fairly straightforward examples of then um, going a bit beyond sort of the thicker samples and um, the more sort of state-of-the-art things. And then finally with a couple of applications. Um, so we heard uh, this morning from Tanme about um, tomography and um, how and why we use it. So I won't spend too much time on this, um, but I just want to highlight it's really good for um, looking at proteins in the native cellular environment. Um, however, because of the mean free path of the electrons, um, there's a practical thickness um, limitation. I mean, we heard this earlier from Chris's talk. Um, and so um, it means that whilst we can look at a sort of proteins and vir isolated viruses, once we get to, and some bacteria, once we get thicker than this, um, the tomography very rapidly becomes too um, thick to produce nice tomograms. And so therefore we use the fib milling to um, thin down our samples. Um, and again, um, so Tammy mentioned this um, this morning, so I'll try to sort of be quite brief, but um, FIB is not the only method that can be used to um, thin material. Uh, the other technique is um, the semivis, so cryo-electron microscopy of vitreous section. So this involves using a microtome at cryo temperatures with a diamond knife to physically um, cut sections um, from um, vitrified um, cells or tissues. Um, and both these techniques have their advantages and disadvantages, um, but the main um, issue is that um, cryosectioning introduces um, lots of distortions into the sample. So here we have um, this um, ribbon of um, sections. So they've come off the knife and sort of been cut in this direction. And so it's a very low mag image of the grid and also, and then a sort of grid square map. And you can see or that they don't look nice and flat. There's these um, um, compressions um, in the direction of the, so this way is now knife mark. Is this, the knife dark cutting direction is this way and um, um, the crevassing and also knife marks. Whereas whilst the fib, um, is not damage free, and I will come and talk about that a bit later. Um, it doesn't um, generate these um, distortions. And so, um, therefore, practically speaking, if you want to go on to do subtomogram averaging, um, cryosectioning is not the best technique for that. Um, and a couple of other things um, both of these techniques, um, the success is very much dependent on the skill of the operator. Although with the FIB, the newer technology, there's a lot more automation. It's becoming much more user-friendly than it was a few years ago. Um, neither of them are high throughput, but um, cryosectioning probably wins out. Um, if, you're, if you're good and know what you're doing, you can produce lots of grids in a single day, each with lots of these ribbons of sections. Whereas um, with the cryofib, um, you're sort of limited to one grid a day and then the number of lamellae depends on whether you're physically sitting in front of the instrument milling or you can sort of run it overnight and do some automation. Um, and finally for cryosectioning, um, this is quite good if you want to look at thicker stuff. This is very routine. Um, whereas FIB, um, it's fairly, I'd say it's routine for doing sort of single cells or small cells, but um, the thicker samples at the moment are still a bit more challenging, um, but methods are very rapidly developing. So whilst I think the most popular choice is FIB um, because of these um, issues of distortions, if you just something want something a bit qualitative, sometimes cryosectioning still does have some use. 
Um, and so I thought it would be interesting to show a um, timeline of um, sort of the developments for cryothib. So unlike in Richard's talk, um, <laughs> this starts in the year 2000. <laughs> Um, and uh, whilst these instruments have been around for a while, it's only sort of the early 2000s that there were first sort of reports of people putting um, cryostages into these dual beams and trying to mill um, biological specimens um, and all these sort of early works. Everything was very homemade, um, lots of adapt adaptations and quite complicated workflows. And it was sort of about 2012 when we first saw the, there were two separate groups that reported the kind of on-grid lamella preparation in the way that we would do now. Um, and sort of mid-2015, so that was when we started to, mid-2010, so that was when we started to get um, more of the publications that were becoming focused on the biology rather than focused on the methods to the point that the end of last year, um, there was this um, 3.8 angstrom in situ um, structure of the eukaryotic ribosome. And sort of in the recent years as well, there's been some more technological developments, a few of which I've shown and I'll talk about a bit later. Um, so now I've done some sort of basic introduction, I want to move on to talk about the instrumentation. Um, so this um, schematic is a basic overview of um, what these uh, instruments look like. Uh, so it's a dual beam, so you have the SEM column and the iron column, um, and these are approximately 50 degrees angle between them. It depends a little bit on um, a manufacturer and specific instrument. Um, but so the SEM column is there for imaging, the FIB column for milling, but also imaging as well. Um, we use it um, for, for example, setting milling areas and by controlling the beam currents, you can control how destruct <laughs> destructive the imaging is. Um, and then the sample is on this cryo stage, and then there'll be other things in here, such as a uh, gas injection system, which I'll talk about a bit later, and various detectors. Um, and so you may have heard recently, there's been a lot of talk about plasma fibs. Um, so the um, sort of more typical um, source that we use, at least in the context of the cryo milling, is a um, gallium source, um, so liquid metal ion source. Um, and um, this, uh, yes, yeah, so there are, you can use other metals, but normally for the milling is the gallium. Um, but then more recently, um, there have been these um, plasma in instruments that use a gas source instead. Um, and these have advantages because they're very good for fast milling of large volumes of material. Um, and also that they've sort of come in um, slightly rebuilt um, instruments so, or smaller chamber with more shielding. So some of the advantages can come from, um, not directly from the um, plasma source, but from um, uh, the chamber. So having um, one of the problems with the milling is the buildup of ice contamination. Um, these instruments have massive um, <laughs> chambers. <laughs> Um, so having more shielding or, or um, making your chamber smaller may help with that and also autoloader just to make workflows a bit easier. Uh, and finally, I just want to um, briefly talk a little bit about um, detectors and image formation, because I know talking to people, this can sometimes cause some confusion because we're used to thinking more about TEMS. Um, so both the SEM and the FIB column are scanning um, beams, so it scans across the specimen and at each point it interacts and then there are various scattering events that happen. Uh, you can have all sorts of different types of detectors that detect um, different things, but for the type of imaging we do, which is generally fairly low voltage um, because we don't want to damage our um, lamellae before they, <laughs> we do our tomography. Um, so we tend to use secondary electron detectors. So these are normally um, somewhere around here. Um, and we can also use these um, in-lensing column detectors as well. 
Um, and for both of these, the images, the what you see in terms of contrast is formed of sort of a mix of the um, topography of the surface and the atomic number and also um, charging uh, plays a role. Um, so now I just want to um, go through a sort of very um, basic overview to how we do the milling. Um, particular and the sort of like canonical cells on grid approach. Um, so we start with um, something growing on a grid, um, single cell, and then um, the milling is done at this very shallow angle relative to the grid, um, milling and uh, to remove material um, underneath and from the top, uh, leaving this finned region in the middle of the cell that's supported by these edges here. Um, and this angle is really crucial um, so that when we come to collect the tomograms, so um, for most microscopes, um, we have practical tilt limits of 60 to 70 degrees. So whilst we would typically um, try to collect a um, as, as close to possible symmetric tilt series, um, um, starting for a pre-tilt to uh, account for this angle, you then can become limited by the state, the physical stage tilt of the microscope as well. So uh, that's why it's quite important to come in at these um, shallow angles and you collect several um, tomograms from one um, milled cell. Um, Obviously, not everyone has the sort of standard the approach that everyone sees of the sort of cells growing on grids. Um, so here are a couple of thing, or other examples that are fairly um, straightforward. Uh, so um, things like things that are a bit smaller, like yeast, um, they are quite easy. The way to do it is to try to get them to cluster a bit and then you can produce these lamellae that go through um, uh, sort of a cluster of a few. Um, then for bacteria, when you start to get smaller, um, it's more difficult to make this kind of lamella. So originally, and sort of one of the first proposed people used to just, rather than milling from the top and the bottom, just mill from the top and create this sort of wedge geometry. Um, which has this finned edge, although in practice, the area that's sort of usefully finned on these, although they're very quick to produce, is still quite a small area. And so now um, most people who are working back to try to sort of make a continuous layer of a few microns and then produce something like this um, instead. Um, um, so now um, I want to go through um, sort of some workflows and what this actually looks like in a bit more detail. Um, so we've already heard this week, so this is our very kind of basic workflow, um, starting with um, vitrification, the milling, the data collection, and then the reconstruction analysis. So we already heard this week about sample preparation. So I don't want to spend um, too much time on this, uh, but I just want to highlight a few things. Um, so the most typical way to do this is by plunge freezing. Um, so if you have adherent cells, they can be cultured directly on the EM grid, something like this. Here, the cell density is really crucial. Um, if they're too confluent, it A, makes the milling much more difficult when they're really crowded together, and B, means that you're less likely to get nice um, vitrification as well. Um, then if you have something, anything that grows in suspension, that's um, fairly straightforward and you just apply it and plunge as you would um, normally. Um, so um, you can also use high pressure freezing um, for this. Um, so and just to briefly outline this, um, so this is what one of these instruments looks like. They're quite big and make a lot of noise. <laughs> They, um, I won't, I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but basically it uses a combination of pressure and temperatures to um, achieve the rapid freezing rates. And instead of grids, you have these sort of sample carriers known as planchettes. They come in a couple of different 
um, formations of, of world depth that are then sandwiched together and frozen. So um, you can fill them with cells, even tissue biopsies, or you can culture cells in them. And they can also these sandwiches can also be adapted for um, grids, so you can freeze. So things that can't be vitrified well by plunge freezing can be frozen on grids um, using high pressure freezing. Um, so now, uh, if we come to the main part of the milling, um, so there are sort of few basic steps for this. Um, so I just want to go through them. Uh, but first, I want to come back to this um, schematic and make sure uh, we all understand these sort of images that I'm about to show and the geometry and the angles we're looking at. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's this um, sort of 52, 54 degree um, um, angle between the two beams. And additionally, the sample is not flat but it's normally tilted to make uh, so that you're milling, so that it's a very shallow angle with respect to the iron beam. Um, many, it depends a bit on the instrument, but many of the holders already have a um, pre-tilt on them to help with this. Um, but um, then what that means is, um, so here I've got some of my own images just to illustrate um, the type of images you get from the different beams. So these, uh, for those of you who know me, you won't be surprised that this is bacteria. Um, and so what I have instead of this um, cell growing on the grid is that I have a continuous layer, a few microns thick sitting on there. And so this is the SEM image. So it's a top view, but it's not a perfect top view. It's a tilted top view. Um, this is my milled lamella. You can see the bacteria in it. This um, is the front of that lamella. This is the back. And if you look closely, you can just about see the quantifoil um, remaining at the back here. And then the iron beam view, this is um, looking down the direction of the milling. So you'll be sort of milling into the a screen. Um, so these images, so this is the lamella side on. So this is this edge. This here is this front edge and this stepped profile that you can see here, you can see in these steps here. Um, so before you get to do any milling, um, it's quite important to do some sample coating to prepare um, the grids for milling. Um, and so there are two types of coating. We do uh, sputter coating and GIS coating. Um, so the sputter coating, um, this can, depends on instruments, so it can be inside the chamber, but quite often is, on, is external. This is our SIAS, one of our um, FIPS we have here, and this is um, our quorum chamber, which is used partly as an airlock for loading, but also has this sputter coating. You can see the nice purple glow. Um, and um, we, so we add a, um, very, a fairly thin, we sputter with a fairly thin layer of platinum. Um, this is important because our samples are insulators, they're ice, they are not very good for the SEM and the milling, and so this helps to prevent charging. Um, then the um, second um, set of coating is the GIS coating. Um, so GIS is the gas injection system. And this is a organic platinum compound um, that's deposited. Um, and so um, this, you have it in, have the needle and the, your sample is here and it uh, basically condenses on the sample due to this temper temperature um, differential. Um, in, in the case of what we're doing um, for more room temperature work, people can also use the iron beam to actually drive the deposition. Um, but um, this layer, it's not particularly conductive because it's not a pure platinum, it's this organic compound, but it's um, very useful in adding a protective layer. Um, so when you're milling um, without it, um, so in a schematic, the you're milling in, this is looking top down on a uh, lamella being produced and milling in this direction. Um, and so without this platinum coat, um, what can happen is that um, 
the front of the lamella starts breaking before you've finished filling the back. Um, this, I mean, these beams are never, like the beam, with <laughs> as much as you'd like it to be perfectly parallel, everything is um, never perfect. Um, and so by having this layer, it just protects the front from breakage. And it also helps um, protect, protect against curtaining. So these are these um, stripes that you see in um, or on the surface of lamellae caused by um, differential milling rates of um, um, different things um, in your sample. And again, this, this doesn't eliminate it, but it helps um, um, reduce it. Um, and so if we come back to um, my example, we can just see these two layers. So this is my lamella and this layer here, um, this is where the sputtered platinum is. It's just a very thin sort of few nanometer layer um, for conductivity. And then you have the much thicker um, GIS coating layer. So now, I'm going to show, uh, use this video from this bioprotocols paper from 2015 um, and show um, the um, milling process. Um, so for milling, your samples are normally generally already clipped before they go in the fib. Um, so you can see the clip ring here. And if you're wondering about this, um, this is the um, Martin Street cutout auto grid. Um, because we're coming at very shallow angles, the edge of the auto grid actually shadows a bit onto the grid and prevents access to um, the sort of bottom half of the grid. And this cutout allows you um, to do that. So if I play. So the first step, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. So the first step um, when setting up is to select your target for milling. Um, so what we're looking for here is cells that are, um, in this case, um, isolated, so not clumped together and also not on the grid bars, but relatively central in the grid square. Um, and so then we need to find the same cell in the iron beam. So find the coincidence point of the two instruments and then set up these milling areas. And so you can see the um, quantifoil um, disappearing and <laughs> milling away in the iron beam. Um, which in the SEM looks something like this. So these first cuts, um, in this case, because the cells are quite small, haven't even gone onto the cell, um, but they're quite important for opening up space later for the tomography. Um, so you normally load your grids perpendicular. The milling direction needs to be perpendicular to tell axis um, so that when you tilt we have this cleared area either side that so that there's nothing that sort of shadows and gets in the way of the tilting and then uh, next step is coming back to the iron beam setting new areas uh, milling through again uh, if you um, note down here, you'll see that the beam currents are progressively going down as we mill. Um, and now in the SEM, you can see the top of the cell has come off. Um, and so this process tends to be iterative, um, doing um, several steps of milling. Normally, you wouldn't necessarily go and image every time between, but um, this is just for illustrative purposes um, until gradually it gets thinner and thinner. Um, I think there's one more after this. Okay, that's the final. And so there's the lamella. And by sort of tilting and rotating the grid, you can see this. Um, lamella that's um, not quite parallel to the grid. Um, there's a little bit of an angle, but a relatively shallow angle. And this is what it looks like in the SEM. And in this case, there's another one being milled over here on the grids. In an ideal situation, you want to get as many of these on a grid as you can. Um, and so just to come back 
uh, I mean, I think that vit video illustrates the milling process quite well, but um, just to come back again, this is one of my own images. So rather than having the obvious sort of lumps of the cells, it's a uh, more continuous layers. You can just about see the grid bars um, in the top there. Um, <laughs> And um, so it's these progressive um, milling, starting with higher beam current. So you do the blue boxes, the green, the orange, and then the purple. Um, and you also see that they get smaller. So the first cut is quite high beam current. So um, you want to mill away the material quite quickly. The current you use varies quite a lot, depending on it's quite, it's quite sample dependent. But eventually, the polishing uh, where you work down to p typical to use somewhere between 10 and 50 picoamps. This is um, because uh, once your lamella gets much thinner, um, you want to be a lot more careful with it. Um, so the lower the beam current gives a nicer, smoother surface and also um, reduces the risk of um, damage during the milling process. <laughs> Um, and particularly warming, you don't want to warm them up, obviously. Um, and some of you may have also noticed these um, vertical cuts either side of my lamellae. Uh, these are what we call micro expansion joints. Um, these are quite good for, um, these really help with lamella stability and help prevent breakage. Um, and so this is an example from um, this paper where it was first, these were first proposed. Um, when you're milling, sometimes the lamellae um, move, up, uh, bend up around a bit and or break, and you end up with the front broken. And also, when you go from the milling instrument to your cryos, um, you can have a beautiful lamella, and then you take it to the cryos, and it's cracked. And having these joints seems to help um, prevent that, probably by reducing some strains on the grid during handling. Um, so that's quite, uh, these take seconds to mill, and it's quite a useful trick for improving the success rate. Um, and so the other question one needs to consider is how thin to mill the lamella. Generally, uh, the thinner you go, um, you increase, you get um, your lamella, your tomograms look much better. Um, so ideally, you want to go below 200 nanometers. Um, however, there is this question of damage during the milling process. Um, and um, that there'll be damage at the surface. Now, depending who you ask, this can range anywhere in the sort of 30 nanometer uh, damage layer. So that was done from using simulations of stopping distance, uh, simulations of the gallium ions um, interacting um, versus um, 60 nanometer damage layer um, proposed um, by um, this paper from the, um, the Gororev lab. Um, I think at the moment it's still not clear how the, the exact extent of this damage layer and how it will impact the subtomogram averaging. Um, but in this paper that was published this year, this was done as an indirect measurement, so used their 2D template matching approach on images, not tomograms, and um, used the cross-correlation scores to um, correlate whereabouts in the lamella and um, saw a drop off uh, below 60 nanometers and so proposed that there was a 60 nanometer damage layer, which means that if your lamella is less than 120, theoretically, the whole thing would be damaged. However, <laughs> They then um, also modeled in the effect of the signal to noise ratio and came up with this optimum thickness of 90 nanometers. So I think there's just not enough sort of high, I think we need some more high resolution structures coming out of these lamellae to hopefully get a better understanding of whether there is a point where you get too thin and you should stop milling. Um, so that's um, the milling portion of this workflow. I'm not going to talk about the collection and the reconstruction because that was how it covered by Tan May earlier. Um, however, your workflow may actually look something more like this. Um, so um, cryofluorescence microscopy um, could be quite an important um, step. This can either be used 
between vitrification and milling, um, sometimes during the milling, because some instruments have a um, fluorescence microscope inside the fib, and also after the milling. Um, so I have a slide to illustrate this. Um, so this top example, this is looking at using um, fluorescence to target, to, to identify and target um, regions of interest for milling. So this, um, these are macrophages infected by uh, microbacterium, which are in green and blue are the nuclei. So um, by overlaying the fluorescence, it makes it easy to target which cells to mill and additionally then try to actually target where to put the lamella. So at the moment, um, targeting sort of an X and Y is fairly trivial. It's still not straightforward to try to get the lamella at the right height in Z through the cells. There are approaches, but I don't think, I mean, they work to some degree um, using things like cryoconfocal data, but it's still, I think, needs a bit of improvement to be um, universally um, useful. Um, so, and then the other use of the cryofluorescence is to um, um, target areas to collect tomograms. Um, so in this example, at the bottom, um, we have lamellae through yeast where a protein in the pre pre, pre Preperoxomial vesicles has been um, fluorescently labelled in green, um, again, nuclei are in blue, and by then overlaying that fluorescence on the medium mag maps in the microscope, it will, could be then used to target which area to um, collect uh, tomograms, um, as um, we've seen here. Um, and so I now just want to take a um, little diversion and talk about briefly about volume imaging um, in the FIBSIM. So you may be aware of this uh, at room temperature in the context of all the brain imaging and connectomics, because um, this is one of the methods that can be used uh, for that large volume imaging. Um, but it can also be done in cryo. So the idea is that rather than milling lamellae, you're using the SEM to take an image, then you use the fib to shave off a thin um, slice from the top of your um, um, block of material and then take another image and keep repeating that until you um, build up this whole stack of SEM images, which can then be used to um, sort of segmented and model um, the um, larger volume. So this is quite useful for getting a sort of view of um, larger material. But also, I think this has quite interesting as a potential as a wet method to actually target um, um, sites for lamellae milling, particularly when you go beyond the sort of cells on grid into tissues and um, thicker samples. And so then the idea is that you'd use this block face milling until um, you start to see features that indicate you're in the region that you're interested in and then switch to um, lamellae milling. Um, and so now I sort of coming back to my workflow, uh, outline again, sorry, um, I want to go and talk a bit more about some of the sort of slightly more, so far, all the cells on the grid, I think that's fairly routine approach. Now talking a bit more about how you go on to look at um, thicker samples and prepare them for tomography. Um, so I just want to start um, with this illustration to highlight some of the problems of um, milling thicker samples in the sort of same approach as you'd use for um, sort of cells and grids. So we cut, we do this milling very low angles. Um, so if you have the cell sitting on your quantifor here uh, to mill a lamella here, it's not a huge amount of material to be removed. It's just the, it's just the material below and above, but already when you go from a isolated cell to a continuous layer, even of the same thickness, to, to make a lamella in the same place, you actually have to remove all of this material as well as this material um, 
to clear this area, to be able to fully clear the area under the lamella. Um, and so when you look at this in 2D, just looking at this area to be removed, you can see that whilst your samples are quite thin, um, the amount of material to be removed is fine, but it very rapidly increases. And um, because milling, it's a process, the, the, time it's, uh, the time it takes to mill is a function of how much material you've got to remove. Um, so as the samples get thicker, like it would be there forever just <laughs> coming in um, at these shallow angles. And of course, this is just calculated in 2D. You have also would consider that it'd be um, the width of the lamella as well. Um, and so then for thicker samples, we use um, other approaches. Um, uh, so there are sort of two main methods, um, lift out or the waffle method, or additionally, there are some sort of um, more, I think, very project specific uh, approaches that involve doing some pre-trimming pre steps with a microtome as well. Um, but if we start by um, looking at um, lift out, so this um, example, these are C. elegans um, larvae. Um, and um, this time it's high pressure frozen. So um, here, so this is the uh, planchettes of the sample carrier um, with this big block of ice. And here cryofluorescence microscopy is used to identify where the worms actually are to mill. Um, and then rather than um, doing the shallow angle milling, uh, the first approach is to mill perpendicular to your um, specimen and clear these trenches, then using either a gripper or a needle come in and attach to the lamella, uh, which at this point is in the region of a few microns thick. Um, then um, mill away the final attachments and then bring this to a separate grid, which has these um, cutouts ready to receive um, the lamella, which is then more that which is then put in the plane of the grid and finally um, polished down much as you would polish a um, standard lamella. Um, so until fairly recently, this was a um, very sort of um, specialized um, approach. Not many labs had the capability to do this kind of thing, mostly um, out of Jürgen Plitzko's group. Um, now there are a couple of commercial systems that make it a bit easier um, and increase the throughput um, because this is not um, trivial using these. So when um, these were made, it pretty it was an adapted PlayStation controller type of thing to um, with these needles to lift these out. Um, the newer system uh, with the micro manipulator, the newer systems use a needle, which is a little bit more automated and user friendly and increases the um, throughput somewhat. Um, so the other approach for thicker material is the waffle method. Um, so this came out a couple of years ago and has caused quite a lot of excitement. Um, so this is a hybrid approach that allows milling of thicker samples um, using high pressure frozen material, but without the need of lift out. So the grid is... <laughs> Um, loaded with sample and then sandwiched between the carriers for the freezing, making this waffle. So effectively, the grid bars make chambers um, where the material is housed. And then, and so the thickness of this is um, the thickness of your grid bars. Um, and then it makes this sort of waffle appearance. Um, so, um, um, and this, and then because it's already on a grid, um, it's in a situation that can be taken to the microscope, so no lift out is needed. So this makes this quite attractive um, and also is nice because there's um, you don't need any special equipment as long as your fib has a stage that can do full rotation, which most of the newer instruments do. Um, you don't need the lift out um, needles, but so the idea is that you've got this thick um, 
these thick waffles, you mill the trenches similar to how um, it's done for lift out, but instead of making the few micron lamella here, instead it's just to prepare these areas, which you'd then um, do, uh, then you tilt and go back to doing a sort of conventional milling, producing a lamella in these um, sections here. Um, so this has opened up and made it easier to deal with thicker samples with the caveat that it, um, you're still limited to what can be frozen within the um, grid squares. So it, you can't really do things like tissue biopsies with this. Um, yeah. And then maybe um, going even sort of further forward, um, looking at this paper that was published it came out on BioArchive earlier this year, again um, from Jürgen Plitzko, um, taking lift out and doing serial lift out. <laughs> so um, in this case, it's a whole um, C. elegans larvae, rather is lifted out in a single block um, and then taken to the receiver grid and um, attached and milled. So each of these slices is like several microns, so it's not, and, and is then polished. So it's not truly serial continuous, but it's regular sampling of a large block. Um, and um, this um, is has a much higher throughput than traditional lift out because you only have to lift this out once. <laughs> Um, and um, with the advances we've had in recent years with software and automation, um, this is much has got a decent success rate. I think I saw one of these talks in here. It was like out of twenty-seven of these, I think twenty-five ended up in successful lamellae. So that's quite a, that's a very good um, success rate compared to the earlier days of lift out. So I think this is quite exciting um, for future for um, thicker samples. Um, and so finally, I just want to um, briefly um, go over and talk, um, show some example of the applications of what you can do with these um, lamellae. Uh, once they're made. Um, so we've already seen this slide this morning um, in Tammy's talk, um, but this is the in situ structure of a eukaryotic ribosome um, where they managed to get to 3.8 angstrom resolution. And this was from a remarkably small amount of material. So 25,000 particles, but less than 100 tomograms and five lamellae, which is one grid. Um, now, most, the ribosome is probably the best target for this kind of thing, just because they're so abundant. The reality is there are very few samples that will go to these kind of resolutions with this few with one grid um but i think it um highlights what can be done with the in situ work um but i think in some ways the more interesting part of this um paper was then this is including some more data as well um is actually looking at the different translation states in in situ so being able to sort out um, I think it was 10 um, different ribosome structures to get uh, um, to um, get a picture of what was actually going on inside the cell, um, which is why we want to do these milling. I mean, there's plenty of ribosome structures out there at high resolution. Um, and so another example of this um, are these um, skeletal muscle sarcomeres. Um, so uh, this did, wasn't as high resolution as the ribosome, but was still fairly high resolution for um, this kind of work. Um, but again, uh, it's I think this is a there are lots of examples out there now, but I think this is one of the nice one and I so that um, really highlights why we do this um, because it give it gave very good insight into how the different proteins interact and are arranged inside the um, muscle filaments um, and so I think I've rushed through for a bit um, um, but yes yeah, so I've gone through and hopefully explained a bit about why we do fib 
and what it could be used for. And <laughs> apologies for the huge wall of text. I just wanted to lift out, <laughs> wanted to list sort of some of the key um, developments um, for the technology and the methodology. Um, yeah, and with that, <laughs> I can finish. Thank <laughs> you.